I mean, I mean, creating that kind of cinematic personality. I, I mean, I think you have to say with Marty, you know, that in some sense, I don't think he knew exactly what he was doing. I mean, these were the kind of movies he could, based on his knowledge and experience, he could do. And uh, I'm not sure he understood that, that he was really making a more radical gesture than people thought at the time, or you know, his friends might have even thought. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Those are those are kind of like big philosophical questions in a way, you know, as applied to, you know, a movie industry that its inherent values don't change all that much over the course of, you know, the genres what is that they like uh, change and so forth. But what is Hugo Cabret? What? What is Hugo Cabret? What is the movie? Yeah. Well, it's about Melies. Okay. Um, who, as you know, uh, having made his important historical gestures, was kind of out of the movie business by, I don't know, the early 20s. He was running a newsstand, wasn't he? It would... That's what the book's about. He's running a newsstand in a, uh, a train station in Paris, and this little boy comes along. And I, I don't know the book that well, whether the little boy knows who Melies is or knows what work he did, but some kind of relationship develops between the elderly former filmmaker and this kid. It's a very beautiful book, by the way. I mean, it's just gorgeous black and white. Uh, and uh, it'll be in 3D. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, sir? Uh, this question's for both of you. Uh -huh. and I'm sorry, I don't remember all the details, but uh, I'll clarify in about half a minute. I, I read a review a while ago. I think it was Pauline Kael's review of Raging Bull when the movie came out. If not, it was some other critic, and it might have been another title, but one between Raging Bull and Goodfellas. Those would be mm -hmm. the two, you know, bookends. Yeah. So irrespective of of who the critic was and what the film was, the, con the film critics suggested indirectly that um, it was worded this way. It seems as though, you know, if the director designed all the shots, I don't, uh, the, you know, critic was suggesting through, in like innuendo, that maybe most of the shots were designed by the cinematographer rather than, S than Scorsese himself. And I wanted your reaction to that, you know, innuendo. No. Very simply, no. I mean, this is a control freak, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, does he have good collaborations with the cinematographer? Sure. But I said to him, for example, you know, the fight scenes in Raging Bull, I said, well, surely you didn't draw out each of those. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, I did. So, and then talking to... Uh, I think it was Michael Chapman on mm -hmm. that picture. Yeah. yeah. On Raging Bull, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was a nightmare for him because, you know, boxing ring is actually soft and he's pushing. You know, we were a little ahead of the, you know, just mm -hmm. having, I mean, they were already, but they were dollying against, and, you know, it was taking twice the number of guys to push the dolly to get the shot that Marty had designed, you know. Chapman didn't get on roller skates the way James Wong Howe did no, for body Champion? And soul. Body and yeah, soul. Right. I mentioned that to Marty, you know. That was pretty good, you know. Um, but, uh, but I talked to Chapman and, and I mean, he loved working with Marty. Most, most cinematographers do because they do in some sense speak the same language. Uh, and, you know, it, it works out pretty well. Would you say that uh, Thelma Schoonmaker, his editor and yeah. the, probably the person closest associated with him over the, for yeah, the last 30 definitely. years, has more freedom than the, in a way than the cinematographer? Not that he doesn't call, not call the shots, but call the final cut. I don't think so. I, I, th I think that is a very close, intimate collaboration between Thelma and who could not be in temperament more different. Mm -hmm. You know, Thelma's kind of a warm, motherly, tends to things kind of person. 
And uh, one of the things that's so interesting about that is the amount of just paperwork that Thelma does, you know, just logging in the variety of shots, you know, and there are many of them very brief, just logging those in and, you know, uh, before they begin to work. And, uh, but it is, it's a very interesting thing because though Thelma's, you know, passionate about what she does and, you know, she's very good at what she does and all that stuff, but uh, it's, it's hard to think of an odder couple being, you know, sitting in an editing room at midnight, you know, <laughs> you know, she's saying, well, here's your first choice take and here's your second, third and fourth choice. And, but the other day you said you kind of liked the third, and so I put that in, and what do you, you know, I mean, it's like, bleh, you know. She's also unusual in that she does almost no work for anybody else. No work for I anyone mean, else that I know of. You couldn't name an, an editor in the, in the, um, in the editor's society yeah. who, only, who only worked for with one director. Well, you know, um... I mean, there are those who in work recent, always with. I mean, Spielberg years, often, yeah. often works with Michael Kahn, but he, Michael Kahn has done other yeah. stuff. Well, I don't know about Eastwood and, and Cox. I don't know that he's done any, anything for Eastwood, in, other than Eastwood for the last 20 odd years. Uh, yeah, but Clint's making like three, four movies a year, so it's. Well, not it's, anymore. He's slowed down. Then again, he does only one take, so what's yeah. there to edit? You'd be surprised. <laughs> either, either we listen to you or to you.